Welcome to the Iowa City Public Library. Tonight is our final event in the Adult Summer Reading Program, and I'd like to thank Beth Fisher, our programming librarian, for all her hard work she put into this summer's events. I'd also like to thank the New Pioneer Co-op for their co-sponsorship of this evening's program. Tonight's program, Seed Savers Exchange, Preserving Seeds, seems a very fitting end to our summer of everyday heroes, reading, and programs. Each of us can be a seed saver hero and help preserve the diversity of our agricultural heritage. This evening, we're fortunate to have Grant Olson, program, Public Program Manager at Seed Savers, as our speaker. Grant came to Seed Savers Exchange in 2011 as the display gardener. Now in the role of Public Programs Manager, Grant guides interpretation and programming, as well as education and outreach, both on and off the farm. Prior to joining the SSE team, he completed programs in environmental studies and anthropology for his BS at the University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh, and he worked as an environmental educator and elementary school teacher. Constantly interested in learning new things, he enjoys wood carving, basket weaving, climbing, building, and many other hands-on activities. Grant is a listed member in the SSE yearbook. He lives in rural Decorah with his wife, Anna Marie, who is here tonight with him, too. Before Grant shares the Seed Savers story, I'd like to encourage all of you to take a trip to Seed Savers. It's a beautiful drive. You can visit Decorah and be even more inspired to grow your own food and maybe even save some seeds for next year's gardens. Please help me welcome Grant. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. And I can attest it is a beautiful drive uh, from here to Decorah. Um, and other folks can hopefully attest to that as well. Um, we do have two events coming up as well that, that tend to bring a lot of people to the farm. We've got our Greg Brown concert this Saturday night, um, where Greg Brown and Bob Black and Dave Moore um, are going to put on a benefit concert for Seed Savers Exchange. And then September 5th, we have our annual tomato tasting event at the farm as well. Um, and folks come, we get 800 people that come to the farm and they taste uh, 60 to 80 different tomato varieties there and, and vote for their favorite one. And, um, so that's a blast. That's September 5th. Uh, but you're welcome to come anytime. The gardens are really at their peak right now. Um, a lot of plants that are starting to go to seed, so you can see some kind of interesting seed saving things happening at the farm right now. So um, thanks very much um, for, for bringing me here. Thanks very much for thinking of us as a, as a hero. Um, and it's, it's a, a real treat to be down here. Um, in Iowa City. Um, we're going to talk kind of generally about Seed Savers Exchange, about the work that we're doing. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, I think, the importance of the work, not just that we're doing, but also the work that other gardeners um, within our seed saving network are doing. Uh, and we're going to end by talking about, um, excuse me one second. Tune it to like four hours. Four hours. <laughs> There we go. Um, at the end, we'll talk about how you can get involved in seed saving and, and uh, hopefully not just in your own gardens, but also networking with other gardeners that you might be in touch with as well. Um, I like to start just by uh, talking a little bit about um, our mission and, and how many folks in here are, are gardeners, by the way. It's about everyone's a gardener here. That's great. Um, does anyone purchase seeds from us? Um, we've got a, a catalog that a lot of folks are familiar with, um, and, and we, we publish that catalog every year. We have since 1995, um, but the organization itself started in the 1970s, um, and we are a nonprofit organization um, with the mission to save and share North America's uh, garden heritage. And we do that in three ways. We have the catalog. Um, like I mentioned, it's been going around since the mid-1990s, and that catalog distributes about 600 different varieties. Uh, across the country and around the world. Um, we also have a seed bank at the farm, um, and the seed bank is the largest non-governmental seed bank um, in, the, in the United States here. Um, we've got records of over 20,000 varieties that have come, uh, come through our doors. Uh, and then we also facilitate what is the world's most diverse seed exchange, and that seed exchange is a gardener-to-gardener -gardener seed swap. Um, and that's how the organization started, and that is um, the exchange in Seed Savers Exchange, it refers to this, this exchange of plant material that's been going on since, um, since 1975. 
The organization started um, with this flower here. Does anyone grow this, or does anyone want to shout out what this is here? Yeah, this is a, a morning glory that we refer to as Grandpa Otts. And um, this morning glory uh, was really important to our co-founder, Diane, who grew up uh, going to her grandfather's house and he always grew these morning glories and she had just gotten married and uh, left home and she was getting ready to start a family of her own and she asked her grandfather if she could have some of these morning glories uh, that he always grew and he said of course he brought out a little white pillbox full of seeds handed them to Diane and said uh, that these are seeds that his father brought with him from Germany when he came to Iowa in the 1800s and that was a story she hadn't heard before but it was uh, actually a fairly typical story as folks were coming to the United States from all around the world they were bringing with them their favorite fruits and vegetables uh, flowers that reminded them of home herbs that were really important to their culinary traditions so we uh, in America have this really rich really diverse garden heritage because of this immigrant culture that we have here folks coming from all over and bringing like the the best most flavorful varieties uh, with them um, this is a picture of, of Diane's grandfather and grandmother, um, and they're standing in these morning glories here. Uh, when Diane got a hold of these seeds, it wasn't long after that that her grandfather passed away, and she felt a lot of responsibility for the seeds that she had inherited because they'd been grown in her family for several generations, and she thought, well, if something happens to, to me, if something happens to the plants in my garden, um, this variety might disappear. Um, might, it might be lost and is... is um, uh, scientist Kerry Fowler who, who runs a seed bank in Norway or used to used to run a seed bank in Norway uh, has said not lost like you've lost your car keys but lost like the dinosaurs are lost you're not gonna get you're not gonna find them you're not gonna get them back um, with that in mind Diane thought well the best way to preserve this variety then is to share it with as many people as I can so she sent letters to uh, Mother Earth News and Countryside magazine different back to the land publications and she said I've got rare seeds that I want to share and if you're interested, you should get in touch with me and maybe we can start a little seed exchange because I know there are other people out there that are in a similar situation that have maybe inherited seeds from family members or found seeds that have been grown in a community for a long time. Um, and she thought, well, the more people growing this, maybe someday there will be a hundred gardeners growing this variety and it's likely that that will protect it from extinction. And now is the case, there are thousands of gardeners that are growing Grandpa Ott's Morning Glory and also the German pink tomato, which she, um, which she obtained from her grandfather as well. Um, this is that, uh, just a, a page out of Mother Earth News with that, that initial letter here on the bottom of the center column here, um, signed from her husband, Kent, her husband at the time, Kent. Um, uh, before they moved to Iowa, they started in, in Missouri. Um, that first year they got about 30 people to respond to their letter and these 30 people they sent along a quarter um, to, to pay for uh, Diane and Kent to send out what they at the time called the true seed exchange. So they took all the letters that people sent and in those letters folks would say I've got tomato seeds to share or I've got Cosmo seeds or I'm looking for this and they just printed all of those letters into a publication and sent that out to the 30 people that responded um, with all of their contact information so they could get in touch with one another and ship and swap seeds. Um, this is the first one that had a cover. It was the third edition. Um, so this is in 1978. Um, this is their son Aaron with a German pink tomato that he's holding. Um, those tomatoes that Diane got from her grandfather. Um, the seed exchange is, is still going on and has since grown um, quite a lot. What started as a little six page publication um, this last year was a 612 page publication uh, that reads sort of like a fruit and vegetable phone book. It's very dense. Um, it has uh, listings for 16,000 different varieties of fruits, vegetables, flowers, herbs, and grains. Um, and this is the, the most diverse seed exchange on the planet. It connects 13,000 of our members with one another. Um, and just as a phone book you go through, you find a variety you want, you look up that person's contact information, you get in touch. Um, we also offer a lot of seeds through the seed exchange as well. Um, I think we offered about 4,000 varieties ourselves through the seed exchange. Um, so this was how the organization started and, and this was sort of it when the organization first began. Um, we also today have an online version of this that you're all welcome to, to visit. Um, the address is just exchange.seedsavers.org and you can browse those 16,000 varieties of, 
of fruits, vegetables, flowers, herbs, and grains. And they've got photos and stories. And um, you can search in the search bar specifically for, like sometimes I'll search Norway or Sweden, or I'm, if I'm trying to find Scandinavian heirlooms, um, I'll, you can search for hot peppers, you can search for drought tolerant crops. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty uh, incredible um, and, and I think a, a, a great resource for any gardener. It's, it's not often that you have access to so much diversity, 16,000 varieties. Um, there are close to 6,000 varieties of tomatoes, there are several thousand varieties of beans, um, pretty wild. When the organization was growing and as the seed exchange was developing, um, Diane and Kent often received letters or in some cases packages full of seeds from uh, gardeners that were participating in the seed exchange. And those letters frequently read something like, I've got these rare seeds, I think the seed exchange is great, um, but I, I want you to have some of these seeds as well. I want them to be in the care of somebody who obviously cares about seeds. In many cases, they were giving seeds to Diane and Kent because they, were, they didn't have anyone else to pass these seeds on to um, in the 1970s and into the 1980s, and even still, um, e even still today, um, folks of previous generations who had grown up saving seeds um, had children that weren't interested in seed saving or maybe weren't interested in gardening even. Um, so it was, it was a interesting few years of transition to to not have anyone to pass on these really rare seeds to that have been in families sometimes for, for six generations. So they sent them to Diane and Kent. They included as much information as they could. Um, so this is a, just a sort of like a foam wrap around some squash seeds with a little story about the seeds on the, on the packaging. Um, this, these are paper bags that came uh, to Seed Savers Exchange and they came with um, sweet potato tubers in them. Um, as the seed collection started to grow, um, it quickly took up Diane and Kent's uh, dining, uh, dining area in their office and they, uh, this is what seed storage looked like um, as they were growing. Lots of envelopes, lots of letters. Um, pretty basic seed storage. They moved their seed collection down into the basement of this of this um, home that they were building in Missouri that was never never quite finished from what I've heard. Um, and shortly after they moved their seed collection to the basement, uh, they received a donation of 1,200 different bean varieties from a gentleman in Maine who had been collecting beans for many years. And they realized at that time that they needed to do something a little more, uh, a little more with these seeds that they had inherited. Now, collecting seeds isn't like collecting stamps where you can put them in a folder and you sort of file them away and when you want to look at them you bring them out or you want to show them to your friends. Um, but seeds are, are living things. Um, they're breathing and they're eating um, and so they need to be cared for appropriately. They need to be grown out every once in a while. Um, and that was when Diane and Kent started to um, think about maintaining this collection of seeds that they had inherited. Um, this is our seed storage today, one of our seed storage rooms. This isn't our longest term seed storage. Um, where the seeds are kept, um, they're kept below freezing. Um, this room is about, I think, 50 degrees. Um, but you can see all of these envelopes here, all of the envelopes in the back, all of these um, canisters full of beans. Um, for the most part, each one of these is a different variety. Um, there might be some duplicates in here. Um, but you can see a little bit of the diversity. And this is just the far corner of the room, and it extends um, up, uh, probably another 12, 15 feet. Um, in that direction as well. Um, so we've got lots and lots of seeds in our seed collection today. We're being a little more, excuse me, responsible with the seed storage, but then we're also growing seeds out at the farm. Um, they purchased a farm in Decorah, Iowa in 1986, and they planted the first gardens there in 1987. They planted potatoes and garlic, and then in 1988 they planted the first gardens for seed there. Um, excuse me. Uh, the farm is a little different than other farms that you may, might see growing produce. Um, and we are growing vegetables there, but rather than growing squash to eat or sell, or rather than growing lettuce or mustard for the market, um, we're growing everything for seed. So actually, many crops grown at the farm are grown in these tents here, and these tents are for keeping insects out or in, um, depending on what's growing in them and how we're managing that crop. Um, but in here, we actually have carrots and parsnips um, in this tent here, and you're thinking, I've never seen carrots or parsnips growing like that with big flowers and, and uh, 
there are lots of crops that we grow pretty frequently in our gardens, like lettuce, like carrots, like parsnips. Um, and, and many of us have, have never seen seeds on those plants because we're not interested in that stage of the plant's life cycle. And we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit further on. Um, but much of the farm looks like this. The farm's about 900 acres, and the gardens are spread out throughout the farm. So in, uh, in one area of the farm, we'll be growing one variety of, uh, of um, tomatoes, for example, and then a quarter mile away in another area of the farm, we might be growing other varieties of tomatoes. Um, so things are pretty spread out on the farm, and that really helps us um, maintain all these varieties that we're growing. Um, I mentioned as well the catalogs. So as the organization had grown and started the seed collection, um, at the time we were really only distributing seeds to members, and we found a lot of folks that were interested in seeds that weren't members and didn't, maybe weren't interested in becoming members. Um, so we started this catalog as a way to reach more people, as a way to send out um, more seeds. So um, we send um, um, we s we send out a, a lot of seeds. I, I think we send out about three quarters of a million seed packets every year, um, which is pretty um, pretty phenomenal, um, pretty fantastic to go from a little uh, operation on a typewriter in a homestead in Missouri to now this um, this huge farm. Um, that we have in this, this huge uh, seed house and seed catalog. Um, I mentioned the morning glories at the beginning. The morning glories are um, sort of a typical example of what we would refer to as an heirloom variety. Um, heirlooms are one of the varieties that we're uh, protecting at the farm and we're encouraging people to grow and save seeds from. So heirlooms can be defined as varieties that have a history uh, within a certain group of people. So a family heirloom may be a variety that has been passed down from one generation to another for 40 to 50 years. Um, there are also heirlooms that have a particular place that they are from. So the fish pepper, for example, is a, a variety of pepper not associated particularly with a specific family, but a, a variety that's uh, been grown for many, many years in the Chesapeake Bay area over on the East Coast. Um, so we define those as heirlooms, variety with, with a long history of being grown and saved and shared uh, amongst a community of people. Um, whoops. Uh, another type of, of variety that we um, protect at our, at our farm and we offer through the catalog, uh, we would call um, heritage varieties or old market varieties. Has anyone grown this, this variety here? So this is a wonderful, great big picnic watermelon called Moon and Stars. And Moon and Stars is a variety of watermelon that was offered in seed, in seed catalogs in the 1920s, 1930s, I think into the 1940s. Um, and then it sort of disappeared from seed catalog. Seed catalog stopped offering this for one reason or another. Uh, might not have been a good seller. Folks might have had crop failures. Um, seed companies are great for sending out lots and lots of, of seeds and getting seeds out to, to folks, but they're not very great at, at preserving varieties or, or, or con being, uh, having conservation programs for varieties because they really focus on what sells, and if something stops selling, then they stop growing it. Um, a lot of the varieties that have been grown in this country at one time or another, um, many have been lost just because they weren't profitable at some point. And it didn't necessarily mean they were a bad variety, it just meant something new came along that caught people's attention. So something similar may have happened with the Moon and Stars watermelon where it just fell out of commercial commerce. Um, Seed Savers Exchange knew about this variety and uh, we were, um, Diane and Kent were being interviewed on a radio program and they had mentioned this variety. They said there's this great variety called Moon and Stars Watermelon that we know used to exist. We've been looking for it for a number of years. Uh, and sure enough, somebody that was listening to the program said, I've got, I've got seeds of that. They've been, they'd been growing that variety in their garden and saving seeds um, for many, many years. And so they uh, were able to give us some of the seeds and we were able to reintroduce that into the, into the commercial marketplace. And um, other strains of Moon and Stars have appeared as well. And so there's Southern Exposure Seed Exchange in the Southeast that has um, started offering a, another variety that they obtained from somebody else. Um, but these are varieties that, old, old market varieties, they're not necessarily heirlooms, they're not associated with a particular family, but um, they're varieties that may have been offered by commercial com seed companies uh, uh, many years ago. Um, that we're also protecting. Uh, and then this is a wonderful variety of tomato. Has anyone grown this before? Green zebra? Yeah, this is a green zebra tomato. It's one of my favorite tomatoes. Um, it is a green when ripe tomato, although it's actually yellow. 
uh, yellowish in color by the time the fruits are mature. Um, but this is a variety that was developed actually by a Seed Savers Exchange member. Um, it's not particularly old. Um, it's not necessarily an heirloom. It's not necessarily a uh, heritage variety or an old market variety. Um, but it's a variety that you can save seeds from. It's a variety that um, now has a place in American gardening culture because lots of gardeners grow this and enjoy this. Um, so we think this is really worth protecting as well. So we encourage um, folks to save and share these. We offer these through our catalog and then we also maintain these in our seed bank. Um, one of the, th the things that we're doing when we're when we're protecting these varieties that we have um, in the in the catalog in the seed bank um, in addition to protecting the seeds themselves we're also protecting uh, the stories as well that are associated with them because we're finding that uh, just a, a seed and a, a vegetable has a, a certain amount of use but when you can add these different cultural attributes when you can add recipes and histories and um, other sort of cultural significance to these varieties, people are a lot more inclined to grow them out. Um, and they also tell different stories of, of American history, for example. This is a pea, um, just called Grandma's Peas. Um, and this is a variety that has a history on the um, sort of the, the wagon train from the East Coast to the West Coast. And so um, this uh, traveled around with a, with a family. Um, this uh, letter sort of talks about um, uh, really a, a, a pretty arduous journey that this family um, went through and um, different members of the family were passing away as they were on this journey but that whole time this uh, his grandmother held on to these seeds that she had inherited grew them out um, when they would settle in one place for a little bit and then save the seeds and continue bringing them with her as she as she traveled um, which is pretty um, pretty fantastic it's great to be able to show bits and pieces of American history um, or global history really um, by talking about where these seeds came from and their journeys. Um, who, who um, I guess, who, who saves seeds? Does anyone save seeds currently from their garden? All right, a couple. What are some things that you, you save seeds from or, or why, why do you save seeds? Maybe that's a better question you want to offer. Yeah. Illegally. <laughs> 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 um, it's a variety of bean, yeah. and it looks like, kind of like green bean here, but the color is a little lighter, and it's um, so tender, and it's just fantastic. Yeah. I, I, my aunt ha has it in her garden back in China, and um, that's wonderful. So I asked from her and brought some two years ago, and then I started to grow them. And That's then great. last year when I went back to China, I tried to get some more, but this time they, they found out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. so, so now I have to say because that's the only, only ones I got. Yeah. So every year I try to save some. Well, that's a, just a fantastic example of, of um, saving seeds from, uh, from home back in China. Um, from family back in China and uh, bringing them here, something that you probably can't find anywhere here, but something that you love growing, obviously, and something that um, performs well for you. So saving seeds is the only way, really, that you can have this variety, so it's an absolute necessity. Yeah, yeah. Other folks want to offer some reasons for s saving seeds? Because my grandmother's four o'clock. Uh-huh. That's fantastic. So saving grandmother's four o'clocks from uh, a long time ago, that's, that's wonderful. And you can really connect to family. You can connect back to family in China. You can connect for Diane, um, related a story where she went back to Germany on a trip and saw some of these morning glories that um, now they call Grandpa Ott's morning glory and they sell them in Germany. But of course they came here first and then somehow made it back there with this, this story. So. Um, connecting you to other people, you know, maybe family um, far away or, or uh, relatives. Um, it's, those are really wonderful reasons for saving seeds. Um, I think saving seeds is really the, uh, and I, I should clarify, I haven't always been a seed saver, not nearly, and actually um, I grew up gardening and I grew up hating gardening. Um, and my folks were real shocked when I got a job at a place where I gardened. Um, <laughs> But uh, I've, I've since converted to seed saving. I don't save all of 
my own seeds, but I do try to save seeds from tomatoes and other things. In a lot of cases, I, I save seeds from things that you, you just can't get anywhere else. You can get so much diversity through seed swaps, through seed exchanges, um, that you can never find and buy every year from a seed catalog. So you get this incredible diversity of uh, tomatoes, for example, different sizes and textures and colors and flavors as well. Um, you get a, just this wild amount of diversity when you're, when you're saving seeds. Um, there are some other reasons for, for, for saving seeds as well. Folks save seeds to save money. If you let one lettuce plant go to seed, for example, depends on how much you love lettuce, but one lettuce plant might be able to supply your lettuce seeds for the next several years. Uh, certainly one tomato plant um, can probably give you enough seed to share with friends and neighbors and family for the next 10 years, and the seeds will last 10 years probably if you're storing them correctly. Um, so it's a great way to save money. Um, it's a great way to, like, like has been mentioned, connect to family members. Um, it's a really great way to promote diversity in your own garden and try things that um, you might not be able to get anywhere else. A lot of our members and a lot of folks that are sharing seeds through our seed exchange started saving seeds because they had a favorite variety that performed really well in their garden. They couldn't imagine a year without it. And then one year they looked and the seed company that they had obtained it from stopped carrying it. And so they had no choice but to try and find some seeds that had maybe been left over um, and then save seeds. And then they've been growing them out ever since. Just, and they've become, in some cases, the only source for these great varieties that maybe ex have excellent flavor, excellent performance in a particular area. Um, saving seeds and, and encouraging a lot of diversity in your garden is really um, important for um, sort of for, I guess, the, the health of your garden and, all, and also, also the performance of your garden in, in hard times. Um, this is a snapshot of some of the potato collection that we have at the farm. We've got over 700 potato varieties um, in our seed collection. And you can see all different shapes, sizes, and colors, lots of different textures and flavors. Um, and are folks familiar with the, the Great Famine in Ireland, the Irish Potato Famine, where about a million people died, a million people left the country, um, it was a result of a lot of different things, political and economic, um, social, but it was also due to some biological things that were happening. Everyone in Ireland grew a single variety of potato called the lumper. Um, because of the way that potatoes are propagated, every potato, um, every lumper potato grown in Ireland was genetically identical to the one that was growing next door and the one that was growing 100 miles away. So when potato blight, a uh, fungus came into the country, it had a whole host of countries that were genetically identical and it could totally devastate all of those crops. Um, in the Andes where potatoes were originally domesticated uh, and, and cultivated, they would grow hundreds of different varieties of potatoes at different elevations of the mountains there, different aspects of the mountains. And so if a disease, a pest, a virus came in and wiped out some of the plants, it was hopeful that many other plants were resistant to that particular disease or virus or pest. Um, so they wouldn't lose the whole crop. Um, because we've got supermarkets and it's, you, you know, food access isn't an issue for um, many people. Um, that might not seem as important, but if you rely on your garden and you grow uh, single varieties in your, in your garden, um, that makes that particular crop susceptible to being lost if there is a virus, a disease, a pest, or if it doesn't like the weather that year. Just one variety is, is, can be can be fragile. Um, as I mentioned, uh, some gardeners grow varieties that they love that for whatever reason were dropped from a commercial catalog. And this is a graph that, that sort of illustrates it. It's not a perfect graph, um, but there was a researcher that went through and looked at seeds that were offered commercially in the early 1900s, in 1903, I believe. And they found, for example, 544 cabbages that were offered. They went 80 years later and looked at what the USDA currently has in their seed collection, and they found only 28 of those varieties are still around. And it's possible that those, some of those other varieties are still being grown and saved and shared somewhere. Um, but the USDA, which is the governmental repository for all of these seed varieties that we have, only has 28 of them. So it's likely that many of them are lost, uh, like I said, like the dinosaurs. Um, this is due to a lot of different reasons. One of the reasons that um, I mentioned was seed companies dropping them, or also some seed companies simply disappearing. Um, in Decorah, there's an old building that says Adam Seed Company on the side. Adam Seed Company was a seed company local to Decorah. It grew varieties that performed really well in Decorah, and at some point it was bought by a larger seed company. 
um, that wasn't concerned necessarily with offering seeds that did really well just in Decora. They wanted seeds that would perform moderately well across the country. So we lost these really regionally adapted varieties that maybe performed perfect for our pests and viruses and climate, um, which is a real shame to lose those varieties that are so important to a particular place. Um, as I mentioned, um, one of the things that we're doing when we're preserving varieties um, and, and when you're, so when you're saving seeds and you're protecting these varieties, um, in addition to um, in addition to the seeds themselves, we're also protecting stories and traditions and recipes. This is the fish pepper that I mentioned. It's uh, got a long history of being grown and saved and shared in the Chesapeake Bay area. Um, it is the one pepper for this particular fish sauce um, that they grow. So by protecting this seed, we're also protecting this recipe as well. This fish sauce doesn't exist without the pepper. Um, and there are apples, for example, that are saucing apples or apples for making apple butter or apple cider. Without those apples, we don't have a lot of the products that came from them. Um, as the country's sort of eating habits and, and as our, our uh, technology and infrastructure has, ch has changed, um, folks don't rely on apples that store really well, for example, or even squash that store really well because you can go to the store and you can get those things um, most times of the year. Um, so we're losing some of these varieties that have characteristics. Maybe it's not the best apple that you pick off the tree and bite into, but it might be the best apple that we're storing. And if nobody's storing things, um, nobody's storing apples to eat, some of those varieties are being lost. So um, protecting them and using them in the way that they're intended, like for fish sauces or for storage or cider or whatever, um, is a, a great way to hold on to those varieties. Um, I want to talk next and for, for the bulk of the rest of the presentation about how you all can participate in this work, how you all can save seeds, um, why it's important. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically about saving seeds as a gardener. And I am still very much at this saving seeds as a gardener um, sort of level. I'm not saving seeds just to preserve a variety. Um, I'm not saving seeds um, to start a seed company or to distribute them on a large scale. I'm really just saving seeds because uh, I want the seeds as a gardener and I love to share these seeds as well. So we'll talk specifically, hopefully, about what's really applicable to your own situations and your own gardens. Um, so some of the things that I'll talk about, I'll give you great recommendations for saving seeds in your garden, whereas at the farm where we're growing seeds on a commercial scale, we maybe are adhering to different standards that might be impractical for a garden. Um, so we'll talk specifically about, um, I should ask, does anyone, nobody has their own seed company here, do they? You're all just gardeners? Great. If you've got, if you're, or if you're interested, ask me and we can talk about what you might want to do differently, but I'll focus on saving seeds just as a gardener here. Um, and I'm going to focus on three crops, four crops in particular, that are easy to save seeds from sort of as a beginner. They're all annuals. They'll produce seed in their first year. Um, and they are, are mostly self-pollinating. I'll explain what those terms mean um, as well. But tomatoes, uh, who grows tomatoes here? So all of the gardeners I see are raising their hands because they're growing tomatoes. And it's America's favorite fruit. Um, everyone grows tomatoes if they've got a garden. And if you, a lot of gardeners that don't grow anything else will grow tomatoes. Um, sometimes in, in uh, five-gallon buckets in their driveway or in bags in their, in their driveway, as we were talking about earlier. Um, so tomatoes are a great way to start saving seeds. Um, beans and peas, as well, are really wonderful crops to start saving seeds from. Uh, and then lettuce as well is, is not a perfect crop to save seed from here in the Midwest because of our climate, but if you, um, if you, if you watch it carefully, it's pretty hands-off. The seed-saving part of, of, of lettuce is pretty hands-off. So we'll talk about lettuce as well. Um, this just is um, a note. This is a lettuce trial that we did um, many years ago. I think there were 900 different varieties of lettuce that were grown out, and you can see all these amazing um, all these just amazing sort of sculptural plants that are being grown in the garden. We did this year have a lettuce tasting, um, which uh, um, was turned out not to be as exciting as it, as it sounds. We had 75 different lettuce varieties available for people to try, and many people got through about 15 to 20, and they were said, I'm done <laughs> with tasting lettuce. The, we have a great eval team, um, Phil and Stefan, who 
grow out lots of different varieties and they take measurements and they do and they taste everything and so they did have to taste all 75 of those varieties over a couple days and their tongues were purple one day and one was green the next day depending on what they started and finished with um, but uh, very interesting um, I want to talk first about uh, kind of what is a seed since we're going to be talking about seed saving um, what is a seed and someone described a seed to me once in a really descriptive sort of memorable way they described a seed as a plant in a box with its lunch and it's very that's really really um, I think that's a very apt description um, so this is a bean seed that I just split in half and took a photo of um, so it is it's a tiny embryonic plant inside this box which would be the seed coat so on the bean what you can see on the outside something that protects the seed um, with its lunch or with some kind of food source um, so this tiny embryonic plant is um, not really growing, but it is um, going through this food source that it's been stored with. Um, so when you're storing seeds, it's important to remember that they are living things, uh, even though they don't look like they're doing much. Um, there's a lot going on inside of there, and they're just waiting for the right conditions to, um, to sprout. And the, the, um, the food is actually, um, who grows beans? How do folks grow beans? So the first leaves that come out of the ground they look different than the rest of the leaves those are the cotyledons and that's this here so this is that's where the food is stored in those first things that come out of the soil and beans um, and then the these leaves folded up these are the first what we would call true leaves so these are the leaves that look like the leaves you're expecting on a bean plant that come out so that's that tiny embryonic plant there um, seeds are produced um, um, I, I need to stop saying this. I used to say seeds are produced kind of like humans are, but they're really not. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, it helped me wrap my head around it when I thought, well, seeds are produced by sex. Seeds are produced when, um, when a male organ produces pollen. That pollen um, lands on the stigma, which could be thought of as the female part of the plant uh, or of the flower. And then seeds form in the ovary after fertilization. So sex happens, an embryo is fertilized, and a seed is produced. Um, and that is not so different from people. Maybe grant me that. Um, understanding seed saving is a lot of understanding um, how this process happens. So how does pollen move from the male organ to the female organ? How do seeds form, and when are the seeds ready? And that's what we're going to talk about um, next. Um, when you're kind of trying to understand seed saving, and, and many of you are, or a few of you raise your hands, is, is that you are saving seeds. Um, something also similar um, in humans, let's say you have two very dissimilar parents. You've got, um, you've got two very dissimilar parents, and they um, produce a child who maybe has a mix of characteristics of each parent. And that's exactly what happens in plants as well. So let's say um, I've got two tomatoes in my garden. I've got this red rib tomato planted in the garden and right next to it I plant this little tiny yellow cherry tomato. Um, an insect moves pollen between the two flowers and then the next I save the seeds and I plant the seeds and I get something like this um, which is maybe the best tasting tomato in the world but it's also not what I expect and it's not reliable. It could also be the worst tasting tomato in the world or it might be a tomato that grows really poorly or um, fruits really late or whatever. The characteristics are all mixed up when you have two very different parents. So when we're saving seeds, we try to keep um, we try to keep pollen just between just within a single plant or between two plants that are within the same variety. Um, and pollination and fertilization, reproduction, um, for most crops, typically only happens if they belong to the same species. So a tomato plus a tomato will produce a tomato. A tomato plus a pepper will produce nothing. Um, so you only have to worry about two different tomatoes, two different lettuce plants. Um, two different squash plants, although that can get a little tricky because there are different species of squash. Um, but we can talk about specific crops if you have questions. But um, the crops that we're going to focus on aren't really inclined to do this. If I've got a lettuce plant here and I've got a lettuce plant planted over by that table, it's very unlikely that they're going to share pollen. Um, they really just reproduce within each flower. Um, so this, what we what we'd call cross-pollination, which is maybe a term that sometimes terrifies new seed savers when they hear the term cross-pollination. Cross um, it just means that pollen is getting mixed up from two different parents that look very different, uh, or taste very different, or grow very different, or have different characteristics. 
So Brandywine plus Brandywine equals Brandywine tomato. Brandywine tomato plus green zebra might equal might something like this, or, or who knows what it is. So you want to try to keep pollen between, variety, between plants of the same variety, or within just a single plant as well. Um, when I was, I mentioned growing up and that I did not like gardening growing up, but I remember planting carrots and I remember thinking at one point, um, I'd never seen a carrot seed on a plant. I knew that tomatoes had seeds inside of them. Um, I knew that cucumbers had seeds inside them, but I'd never seen a carrot with seeds inside of it. But I thought, I know they're small, they're probably in there. If I cut open a carrot, I'm sure I'll find seeds. And I never tried that. And I'm glad I didn't because I would have never found seeds and I would have looked for a very long time. But I'd never seen carrot seeds because I'd never seen carrot flowers before, at least what I knew to be carrot flowers. Um, and so that really helped me understand seed saving when I was, when I was first getting into seed saving. Um, flowers exist to produce seeds. All of our garden crops that we're growing um, produce flowers and then produce seeds. And there are some seeds that are produced without flowers. Um, but if the only purpose from the flower's perspective um, is to produce, or from the plant's perspective, the flower's purpose is to produce seeds. So if you're looking for seeds, start by looking at flowers. And if you've never seen a flower, um, the best advice is just to wait. And hopefully you'll see one. And I'll talk about some crops that are really tricky to, to see those flowers as well. Um, some, so plants can be annuals, biennials, perennials. I'm going to simplify it and talk about plants with our vegetable crops as two different types. So annuals will produce seed in one year. Lettuce uh, will produce seed in one year. Um, Tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, they'll all produce seeds in one year, even though tomatoes will live a lot longer than one year if, if, they, if they've got the right conditions. Um, peppers will last several years if you bring them inside in a pot and then bring them back out and bring them inside. Um, but we'll call them annuals just because they produce seed in one year. Um, does anyone know what this is, by the way, on the, the screen? Yeah, this is lettuce. So lettuce going to seed, and I had never seen lettuce in this stage in my life. They get, um, until I started working at Seed Savers, and I was like, oh, what is this plant? And they're like, it's lettuce. Are you kidding me? You don't grow lettuce? And now I say that same thing to visitors when they come, and they don't know what lettuce is, even though five years ago I was in the same exact boat. You don't know what that is? It's just lettuce. Um, Everyone, so many people grow lettuce, and I brought in a lettuce plant, actually, that I um, cut out of the garden and dried, um, just so you can see the flowers. And the lettuce is a distant relative of dandelion, and they've got little tiny dandelion-like flowers that open up, dozens of them on a single plant. Um, and they're open for a little bit. They produce seeds, and the seeds get those little feathery parachutes, just like um, dandelions. And there are actually some in here that have little feathery puffs. So I wanted to pass that around just to, you can check that out. It's uh, because so many people grow lettuce, but because people have often never seen lettuce seeds, you can at least see those feathery parachutes. That's a good indication of when the seeds are ready. Um, annuals produce seed in one year. Um, and then there are biennials. And does anyone know what this is on the screen? This is a tougher one, I think. It, it is not an herb, although it looks an awful lot like uh, something in the mint family in this picture. This is actually, uh, these are actually beets in this picture. So beets, when they're growing in their first year, they get leafy foliage about that big. And in their second year, they get six feet tall. They get thousands, uh, or, or maybe I should say hundreds of little flowers um, that open up tiny, tiny, tiny little flowers that are wind pollinated. Um, and then they produce seeds, but they don't produce seeds in their first year. Um, beets and Swiss chard, which Swiss chard, same species, that it looks identical when it's flowering. Um, carrots and parsnips, which is I'd never seen a carrot flower because I let them grow for a year and my dad told me to dig them up and that's what I did. And um, <coughs> if I would have let them over winter in the garden and if they would have lived, I would have seen flowers that next year. Um, Do the flowers look yeah, yep. So carrots and Queen Anne's lace are the same species, and the flowers look identical. Um, and in fact, they will share pollen with one another as well. So if you're growing carrots and you got carrot flowers and you try to save seeds, but you have Queen Anne's lace growing somewhere else, and, in, and an insect's moving pollen between the two <coughs> plants, 
you plant those carrot seeds next year and you get little rubbery white carrots that are really terrible. Um, but biennials, um, another description that kind of has stuck with me, someone described biennials to me as biennials are annuals in denial. And they're annuals that think they're going to live forever. Uh, and so they don't worry about reproduction. They're not thinking about the future. They go through this first year and they're like, this is great. I'm alive. I've got plenty of time to think about having kids later. And then they go through a winter that's really stressful on them. Um, and that stressful sort of period, um, in my mind, they start to think like, oh, I'm not going to live forever. I need to start thinking about the future of my, you know, what am I leaving? What's my legacy? And so then they start producing flowers and producing seeds after that kind of stressful winter. But they need those cold temperatures to produce flowers and produce seeds. Here in the Midwest, um, unfortunately, if you were to just leave the plants out in the garden, often the winters aren't cold enough just to freak them out a little bit, but they're cold enough that it kills them. So at our farm, we actually dig up all of our carrots, all of our cabbages, kale, broccoli, kohlrabi, cauliflower, um, all of our onions. We dig it up. We put it in a root cellar that stays cool, but not freezing, freezing cold. Um, and then we plant them back out in the spring. Um, and you can do that in your own garden. Um, Anna and I actually tried to overwinter carrots and salsify and onions um, in a little Rubbermaid bucket in, the, in our garage that um, we thought was going to not freeze. It ended up freezing, but it stayed moist in there and it stayed cool. And had we been a little more um, on the ball, um, those plants probably would have lived. And some of the carrots lived and sprouted the next year. Um, we also had onions that we left in the garden that are now flowering. Um, they didn't die over the winter. Um, you can mulch really heavily in your garden uh, if, you, if, if, you, if you don't want to dig them up or if you don't really have a place to put them. Um, you can mulch really well and hope that they make it over the winter and then they'll produce flowers and seeds in the next year as well. Um, but biennials are a little trickier. We've, got lots of, trickier. we've got lots of resources online that talk about saving seeds from biennials. I'm happy to ask, answer questions if your favorite vegetable is kale and you want to learn how to save kale seeds um, or whatever, cabbage. Um, so in addition to different life cycles, there are also different ways that reproduction happens in a flower. So um, who's got to guess what this flower is? It's a pea flower here. So the pea flower is a self-pollinating flower. Um, Peas are, I don't have a, I have another diagram that maybe I'll bring up if anyone's really curious about peas. Um, but, so peas have male and female organs in that one single flower. And pollen only moves from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower within that flower. So it's really unlikely that an insect's going to move pollen around. Um, it, we call that self-pollinated. And so beans and peas and lettuce are all really inclined just to self-pollinate. So you don't have really have to worry about that, that crossing, that, that two different varieties um, deal. We try to encourage people to plant self-pollinating crops like beans, peas, and lettuce um, 20 feet apart if you have it in your garden. If you don't have it, just plant them as far apart as you can, two different varieties. Um, but you can plant um, all of the Amish snap peas you want in one area, and then if you want to save seeds from uh, green arrow pea, just plant it as far away as you can in your garden, and it's really unlikely that you're going to get any, any mixing up um, to occur. Um, I should also mention as well, if a seed gets mixed up and it's not the rarest variety in the world and you're not the only one with those seeds, um, it's, it's probably not the end of the world and what you get is going to be edible and what you get you might really like. Um, it just won't be what you expect. If you got something really rare, definitely try to grow it away from other beans or peas or lettuce or whatever. Um, but 20 feet is, is going to be more than enough if you've got that much room. Um, so this is a self-pollinating plant. Um, tomatoes can pollinate themselves as well and, and often do. Um, but they're a little more promiscuous than just a pea or a bean. And so they will share pollen with, with other tomatoes that are that might be planted close by. They are similar to this flower. They're, they're self, they can pollinate themselves, but they're also pollinated by insects. And does anyone know what this flower is here? I heard, uh, I heard okra. Um, this is an okra flower, and I brought in okra pods as well, just because 
Um, at this point in the presentation, some people might be falling asleep, and I want to make sure that you've got something tactile to do. So this is an okra pod, um, and you're welcome to just split these open, and you can take seeds home if you want. Um, but uh, a good indicator for, um, uh, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but a good indicator for okra and beans, or when things are dry and brittle, the seeds are probably ready to, ready to go. So. Um, I'll pass this around. Um, like I said, feel free to take any seeds if you want them. I can send out more information about the variety. All I know is that it's in our collection. It is Okra 105, which is not that much information, um, but I'm happy to share if anyone does want to take any seeds home. But yeah, feel free to break those open, and we, we've got plenty of those. Um, so the Okra flower is big and open and showy. It's got these little landing strips inside the flower that are very attractive to insects. Um, so it wants insects to get in there and to move pollen around, um, which is great for the plant. Um, but as a seed saver, if you've got two different varieties of okra planted right next to another, we're in Iowa, how many varieties of okra are people growing? Probably not more than one. Um, but uh, you, maybe your neighbor has an okra variety. Um, and so if insects are moving pollen around, you might get some of that mixing up. So um, try to plant these even further apart far apart as you can in your garden. Um, what about this flower? Squash. So squash. Yeah, so squash is insect pollinated. Squash flowers actually are either male or female. There are some flowers that have both male and female organs, but they don't produce seeds very well. Um, so they require insects. They need an insect to move pollen from that male flower to that female flower, and then uh, seeds are produced and if um, now's a good time to actually see this if you've got squash in your garden the female flowers have little um, th they've got little tiny immature fruits at the base of the flower and the male flowers just have a straight stalk um, and it's it's easy to see when you're looking at the plants um, because they require insects we at our farm we plant these really far apart we'll plant these a quarter mile apart two different varieties of squash and who's got a garden that's like a quarter mile or a mile or so I didn't think so. So with, there are other ways that we pollinate squash. Um, we will pollinate squash by hand, which I can talk about at the end if anyone has questions about poll hand pollinating squash. Um, or we grow them really far apart. Um, we will grow melons and uh, watermelons in big cages and we'll put insects inside of those cages and then they'll do the pollination work but no other insects can get in there. Um, so there are some other things that we do um, that if, if anyone wants to talk squash at the end, let's, or right now. Well, uh, watermelon, cantaloupe, honeydew, cross-pollinate mm -hmm. with zucchini, butternut, uh, other squash varieties. Mm -hmm. um, no, the melons won't cross with a uh, squash variety. Um, if uh, a cantaloupe and a honeydew can share pollen with one another, um, a watermelon and a melon won't share pollen with one another. Um, and then a uh, summer squash and a winter squash could potentially share pollen with one another. Um, squash are kind of a tricky thing because what we refer to as squash, there are four, well, three common species that people are growing in their, in their gardens. And not all of those species will share pollen with one another very readily. So you might be able to grow a summer squash and a winter squash right next to one another and you won't have to worry about pollen moving between the two varieties. Um, but it depends on the species. So when you get a seed packet, take a look at the species. And if, um, if they're two different species, your summer squash and your winter squash, you can probably save seeds from them and grow them pretty close to one another. So. Now, what would you consider the minimum distance, mm -hmm. say, between an acorn squash? Oh, thanks. An acorn squash mm -hmm. and a butternut squash. If you're going to save seeds, what would be the distance that you would mm -hmm. consider minimum? If they are the same species, the our minimum is our minimum is a quarter mile. Wow. If you if you are if if you're able to plant them on either sides of your house or either side of a fence, anything you can put in between them um, to keep the insects from having kind of a straight line from one to another um, is going to be helpful. But in your garden. Um, I just plant them as far apart as you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And you had a question as well, yeah. Um, so, waste pot. 
We have um, a zucchini stretch separated by about six feet of a yellow squash stretch mm -hmm. of plants. And um, for some reason, one of these plants keeps producing yellowish, greenish plants. Mm -hmm. Is that just an oddity, or is that the, because of the pollination? Yep, it's, is it, it, is, uh, it is just an oddity. So the, um, let's say you've got your two varieties of squash. If they're sharing pollen, the fruits will be, the fruits should be expected. You should, you should get the fruits that you're expecting. And if crossing occurs, it won't appear in, until the next generation. Um, the exception is with corn. And with corn, you actually can see if two different varieties have shared pollen with one another. Sometimes you can see in that first generation um, what the, um, you, you can tell if they've been mixed up. So if you're growing sweet corn, for example, and you're saving seeds from sweet corn, sweet corn kernels are really wrinkled. And if you notice you got big fat blue kernels in with these wrinkled um, sweet corn kernels, then something happened and they've, it's shared pollen with something else. But um, sounds like just a, just a weirdo in the garden, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just talked about this crop. Who's? What about this flower here? Mm -hmm. I love this one because we're in Iowa, and everyone should know what this one is. So these are corn flowers. So these are male corn flowers. Um, corn plants have separate male and female or flowers as well. The male flowers are the tassels up at the top, and then the female flowers are inside the ears of corn. Um, the silks that you're pulling off before you make, before you use the corn, those are the stigma, the female sort of pollen receptive part of the flower that catches the pollen that falls down on it and then fertilizes the ovary and produces the kernels. So each one of those silks is connected to uh, a flower that produces a, a kernel. Um, and they're pollinated by wind. The pollen's really light. You can see in this picture these really fine yellow dots and that's the, the corn pollen there. So when on a windy day, corn pollen might be traveling a mile, two miles, really long distances. So we actually hand pollinate all of the corn at our farm, which involves collecting pollen from the tassels at the top and then um, by hand on each ear, um, 40 different varieties a year, 300 plants of each variety going around to each one of those plants and pouring pollen onto the silks and then covering them back up quick so that no other pollen gets in there. So it's a laborious process. Um, if you were somewhere that wasn't in um, corn country, you wouldn't have as, as much difficulty. But because our neighbors are growing corn and because we're growing so many different varieties of corn, um, we take every precaution we can to make sure that their pollen isn't getting into our plants. So do you have a question? Are you close to any GM products? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is if we're, if we're close to GM, um, corns and I can't say for sure um, what the what all of the neighbors are growing I'm sure that we're within two miles of some of those crops um, and so um, partially because we can't be sure what's going to be getting we, we just make sure that any corn pollen within five miles isn't gonna actually any corn pollen within a couple hundred feet because we're growing two different varieties of corn maybe not so far apart from one another um, for non-GM crops in our collection, we're growing really close together. Um, so, yeah, we take every precaution to, to prevent that. So, yeah. And she, she said, was, do you have any ancient varieties? Mm -hmm. Do you have any ancient varieties of corn? We do in the collection, and I don't know um, when it's been grown out most recently, but as far as ancient varieties of corn, we do have, we have grown in the past uh, Teosinte, which is a, corn sort of precursor to corn that has little ears about this big and maybe five or six kernels on each on each plant. So we do have some very old um, crops. I'm not sure if that's going to, I'm not sure how often we're going to grow that out. Um, I have never seen it grown out in my time there, but, but we do have some old varieties, yeah. And Terry and I have a uh, one cob of corn that grows with individual husks around each Yeah, corn. pod corn, yeah. Pod corn. Mm -hmm. And uh, we haven't grown any as of yet, but we're yeah. looking forward to doing it next spring. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I understand that the corn's from the uh, tombs uh, in Egypt. 
oh, had all the kernels growing on the uh, tassels, uh -huh. and uh, that that was the early precursor to uh, broom corn. Sure, yeah. So I was wondering if you were, you know, I, I understand that seed savers, I don't know a lot about you, mm -hmm. but I was wondering how ancient your yeah. archives might be. Yeah, we get some, um, you know, we get some seeds donated that we don't know, we don't have a lot of information about, and we can, um, in the past we sort of took, even if we got a variety donated to us that didn't have a lot of information associated with it, or we couldn't confirm that information, um, we would grow that out at the time, and now we're sort of going back through a lot of the varieties that we've had, in some cases, for many, many years, and trying to find out more information about each one of those varieties, so. Um, I don't know what our oldest corn is, um, but our, um, certainly our, uh, most of the crops that we have are much, much more recent than that, yeah. yeah. Um, as I mentioned, kind of seed saving for beginners, so, so we've talked a little bit about how seeds are, how, um, how reproduction occurs, um, talked a little bit about different life cycles, so um, I mentioned the seed saving for beginners, we talked about um, tomatoes, beans, lettuce, and corn. I just want to walk through step by step the process for saving seeds of each of those crops. So with tomatoes, um, and it seemed like most folks here are growing tomatoes out, um, I think tomato seed saving is really fun. It is a little more in depth um, than beans or peas or lettuce, but it's also, uh, it feels like you've done like something really cool when you're saving seeds from tomatoes. Um, you save seeds from ripe tomatoes, tomatoes that are, ri are ripe enough to eat, so they should have a little bit of give when you, when, you, um, when you squeeze them. They can be a little bit overripe, but you don't, want them to be, you don't want them to be too far gone on the plant. So harvest the fruits that you would be ready to eat, and then we cut them in half along the equator. Uh, if you think about the blossom and, and stem end as the poles. And we just squeeze out the seeds and pulp and juice uh, into a container like this, and then we just set it out of direct sunlight, and we, we leave it for two to three days. Um, we might stir it up every day, uh, but after two to three days, sometimes you'll notice some mold occurring on the top. A uh, good way to tell if, if this process is happening is by the scent, because it starts to stink and attract flies. So don't put this as like a centerpiece on your kitchen table, because um, it will start to attract flies and, and smell a little bit. But uh, what's happening is it's fermenting, just like you know, if you're making sauerkraut or kimchi or beer or all these other fermented um, products, <coughs> fermentation is happening, which is why we squeeze out the, the juice as well, because we want those sugars to ferment. Um, what happens out in, in nature, so tomatoes have these enzymes that prevent seeds from sprouting. And what happens out in nature is that a tomato fruit falls on the ground and it rots. And that rotting process breaks down all these enzymes that prevent seeds from sprouting. But because we don't want to dig through rotten tomatoes, we get the tomatoes first. And then we let them go through this fermentation process in jars. Um, after two to three days, we stir it up kind of vigorously. And then the good seeds all sink to the bottom of the container. And the bad seeds and all the junk float at the top. So you, par you pour some more water in there, you pour out all the junk that's floating at the top and you leave the good seeds at the bottom. And then we rinse them out in a, a wire strainer like this and set them out to dry Whoops, on a coffee filter. We like coffee filters because tomato seeds are really sticky, but they don't stick to coffee filters. And I don't know why that is, um, but tomato seeds, pepper seeds, eggplant seeds, that whole family, the seeds tend to be sticky, but they don't stick that, that much to uh, um, coffee filter and we just let them sit out of direct sunlight um, for a week, a week and a half. We might put a fan on them if it's really humid and then they should feel dry if you kind of rub your fingers through them. They shouldn't be sticky anymore um, and then they're ready for and then they're ready for storage. Um, beans and peas, the seed saving process is pretty similar. Um, with beans and peas, um, we wait until the seed pods are really dry and brittle, and the seeds inside are really hard. So just as with the okra, it's dry, and, and it, this isn't super brittle because it's been in the basement that's a little humid. Um, but uh, when, the plot, when the pods can split open and the seeds inside, you shouldn't be able to dent with your fingernail. Then you're ready to pull the pods off the plant um, and then break the seed pods open. Um, the um, simple and time-consuming way is just to split open the pods one by one, get the hard seeds out, and then let them dry maybe for a couple days. 
auto direct sunlight and then um, put them into storage. But if you're doing a lot of them, uh, we go through threshing and winnowing. Um, who's heard the term separating the wheat from the chaff? So that is what threshing and winnowing is. It's separating wheat, or in this case, bean seeds, um, from chaff, which is junk that's not a seed, basically, a scientific word for junk that's not a seed. So it might be leaves or pieces of the pod or dirt. Um, so we like to kind of crush the pods up a little bit. Um, we will often put seeds in like a pillow sack or like a woven um, sack like this and then jump around on them or um, um, roll on them. We've seen these old seed catalogs that encourage people to put them in a pillowcase and hang them from a tree and hit them like a pinata with a baseball bat. Um, anything to, you're just trying to break open the pods and get the seeds out. As long as you're not applying so much force that you're breaking all the seeds in half. Um, and the seeds, seeds can, be, can be pretty tough. Um, so stomping around on them like this probably isn't going to hurt the seeds and it's not going to hurt most of the seeds. Um, after we stomped around on them for a while, um, we'll put that mixture into a bucket and you can do this on a windy day or you can use a fan like we've done here. We just pour the seeds and in, in, in the pods in front of a fan. Start on a low setting so you don't blow all the seeds away and you can crank it up as you need to. Um, but the light chaff, like the pods, will just kind of float away. You can see them around the ground here and then you can see a lot of the seeds are just kind of falling here and you can see this other chaff just kind of flying around there. Um, and then this is what the bucket looked like after just one sort of, we just poured it in front of the fan once. And you can see lots of pods over here. And this whole process from after we picked the seeds to getting this took like four or five minutes. It's so quick. And I've spent hours shelling bean seeds by hand. And you can see it's not perfect. There's some beans that have broken in half. There's some pods still full of seeds. But um, for five minutes worth of work, having a bucket full of seeds is pretty it's pretty great. Um, and, and peas, very much the same way. Wait till the seeds are really hard. You can't dent them with your fingernail. Um, pick them when the pods are dry, crack them open, and, and put them in front of a fan. So I mentioned lettuce as well. And lettuce is, uh, how many folks are growing lettuce um, here? A lot of folks grow lettuce. And when you're growing lettuce, um, I was always told once it starts to get tall, you pull it out because it tastes gross and it's got that milky substance that comes out when you when you harvest the leaves. Bitter. Very bitter, yeah, really bitter stuff. Um, and with lettuce, um, I showed this picture earlier. So lettuce will get to be, it might be three feet tall, it might be four or five feet tall, and it gets lots of dozens of little yellow flowers that look like tiny dandelions um, that will eventually produce these feathery parachutes. So lettuce flower opens up. It's only open for a few hours. It closes and then it doesn't open again uh, ever. And then the seeds start to form. And once you see these feathery parachutes, which is two to three weeks after the flowers have opened, then the seeds are ready to harvest. Um, there are two, um, two ways to go about harvesting lettuce seeds. One is to do as she's doing here, taking a bucket or a bag and just tipping the flower heads over once they start to, once you start to notice those parachutes and giving them a shake and then the seeds that are ready will just fall out. Um, and then you go and visit the plants in another few days and more seeds will be ripe so you can shake, the, shake it again and get more seeds that way. Um, you can also just cut the plant off at the base um, stick it upside down in a paper bag and then the seeds will continue to mature uh, over, over a few days, over a week. And then, um, so you get not as many seeds total, but it's a lot quicker um, and you get, you get great seeds that way. Um, lettuce seeds are too small to thresh and winnow. Um, so we will, sometimes we'll just rub the um, seeds and, 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 uh, and flowers in our hands. And then we get seeds that come out and they come out with some chaff. Um, and even just like blowing on them, like whoosh, you start to blow the chaff away and the seeds um, don't go too far. But don't use a fan because you will lose all of your lettuce seeds. Or you put a fan in front of where you want to plant your lettuce seeds next year and you just let the seeds blow uh, into the garden and then you just don't worry about them until spring. 
So when, when seeds are um, getting ready for storage, it's important that they're dry and um, there's a really rudimentary test to tell if seeds are dry enough for storage. If you've got beans and peas, um, you set one on a table and you hit it with a hammer. And if it shatters like glass, uh, like this one here, it's, it's dry enough for storage, or this one here. Um, but this one you can see is kind of smooshed a little bit. It means there's too much moisture, so keep drying those seeds out. This seed obviously you wouldn't want to store, but the rest of the seeds that we're drying along with it, um, it's a good indicator of what the, those seeds are all doing. If you can get your fingers on the seed, like a squash or a cucumber, try to bend it. And if it snaps really cleanly in half like this, um, it's dry enough for storage. If it bends like this, you want to keep it out of direct sunlight, maybe put a fan in front of it and let it dry for another week and then try another seed and see what that does. With small seeds like tomato seeds and pepper seeds, um, it's really about feeling them. So if you pick up, uh, if you take a pinch and you kind of rub it in your fingers, if it feels dry, um, it's probably good enough for storage. You might want to leave it another couple days, but if it feels dry, it's probably, you can probably be safe to store those. Um, I like to store my seeds in paper envelopes, and this is, um, I always mean to change this picture and I never take another one, um, but I try not to seal seeds in a container, um, especially if I'm going to use them within a year or two. If you put them in paper and there's moisture inside, that moisture can escape out of the seeds. If you put them in a plastic bag or a glass jar that's sealed really tightly, and there's moisture, it has nowhere to go, so the seeds might get mold on them, it might sprout if it's really, really wet. Um, if, if you're comfortable that they're dry enough, you can put them in a container like this and you can put a, a lid on it. Um, some folks will put, um, you know those desiccant packets that you get in electronics, like silica gel? You can put one of those in a jar like this as well. Um, but uh, I'll put seeds in a paper envelope, and I have seeds um, at work, just in a just in a closet, it's dark. Um, it is dry. Um, it's air conditioned in the summer, so it's not humid in there. Um, and it's cool. And it's cool-ish because it's air conditioned in the summer. It's an, it's out of direct sunlight. Um, it's away from insects. So cool, dry, dark, and away from insects. And everyone's question next is, well, how cool? How dry? How dark does it need to be? Um, if you're going to be using the seeds within a, within a few years, um, the, I mean, really the, the answer, and it frustrates everyone, is cool enough and dry enough um, and as dark as you can make it. So um, seeds don't really like temperatures more than 85 degrees, so definitely keep the seeds below 85 degrees. The cooler they are down to freezing, um, the slower they'll go through that food source that they're stored with, the, their lunch. Um, so the longer the seeds will last, and the warmer it is, the quicker they go through that food source. So their life is a little shorter, that embryonic plant's life is shorter, and they don't have enough energy to sprout at a certain point because they've used all of the food up that they have. But um, keep it as, as cool as you can. Some people will put seeds in the refrigerator, which we always said never put seeds in the refrigerator too, because it's too humid, but we found um, that refrigerators aren't, aren't terrible. Um, but if you've got a spot that stays, you know, stays below 80 degrees and is pretty stable temperatures and it's dark, um, that's a great spot for seed storage. So closets work great. Closets on the north side of the house, something like that. Um, uh, also in this um, picture, you notice I've tried to write a little information about it because um, even if you're a tomato expert, um, all tomato seeds look the same, and if you put them in storage and you don't label them, um, which I still do frequently, um, you're not sure what they are. And so you can grow them out and find out the next year. Um, but keeping good records like this, when you harvested it, a little bit of a description. Uh, and then I like to put where I got the seeds from. This is a code that we use in the Seed Savers Exchange. It refers to a person. This is actually Craig's code. Um, Craig LaHoulier is a tomato breeder and came to our conference a couple weeks ago. Um, these are seeds that I received from him. Just in case something happens, I know where I got it and hopefully I can get more seeds uh, if I need to. And then the last thing I want to mention is, is sharing seeds. And, and this is something that we've been encouraging since we started. Uh, saving seeds is great, um, but if you are 
just saving seeds in your own garden and you've got this great variety and you're never giving it to anyone else. Um, it's a value to you, but it's, and maybe that's enough, but I think as gardeners, typically we find something we love and we want to tell everybody about it. And if we have seeds to give them, that is even better. Um, so we really encourage people to share seeds as well. Like the, um, the uh, Moon and Stars watermelon I mentioned at the beginning, this, this one guy was growing this variety and saving the seeds, but uh, it wasn't really until he shared those seeds with us that we were able to get thousands of other gardeners growing this variety now. Um, and also is Diane, sort of the philosophy behind Diane's original founding of the organization. The more people growing a variety, the less likely it is to disappear. So by encouraging more people within your network of people to grow these varieties out, the less likely it is to be lost. And also the more uh, history it develops in your area, the, the more it can adapt to the conditions that are um, in this particular place, the climate, the pests, the viruses, diseases. So hopefully over time, as more gardeners are saving seeds and sharing seeds with one another, that variety will continue to do better and better in this particular area. So um, sharing seeds is the last thing I want to leave folks to, but I know we've got time for questions. I, you didn't give me a, you said as long as we want. So uh, I will open it up for questions. Um, let me know. You do have to use it, so. Raise your hand and we'll pass it around. Terry and I have probably a more generous garden space than most in town. Mm -hmm. 40 feet by 20 feet, a nice sized garden. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at the same time, we have to recognize the fact that we're minimalists. And by that I mean, when we grow our Polish Laguistas, mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we have at least 12 feet between those and our mortgage, mortgage lifters yeah. so that we can collect those seeds. What we don't know is what kind of cross-pollination and what's the minimum distance between, say, our, our red pole beans and our green pole beans. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we need information on, on what the parameters are mm -hmm. for cross-pollination and how much distance we need between species uh, so that we can be the uh, most successful at this as we can be. Mm -hmm. Where would I find that information? Yeah, I'll give you two resources. Um, one of which is, is our website, um, seedsavers.org. We've got um, crop-specific seed saving recommendations um, throughout the website um, that would, that. I, I won't say they're, they're, they're not outdated, they just haven't been updated yet. The most recent um, work that we've done to sort of put together a guide like that is the publication of a book um, called The Seed Garden. And I, I remember you guys were going to look it up. I'm not sure if you've got it here at the library. Get to the catalog. Okay. So it might be here, and if it's not here, we're going to send a copy down. Um, but it's called the Seed Garden. Um, we, we've got it on our website as well for sale. But the Seed Garden, um, what has typically happened when folks are looking for really specific recommendations is that the recommendations that are given out are usually for commercial seed production. So, um, for example, we would say you're growing out two different varieties of tomato. At our farm, we separate them by, I think, 200 feet, um, which is most folks don't have 200 feet in their garden. Um, but that is 200 feet because we're growing a tomato and then maybe we're not growing anything until we grow another variety of tomato over there. In a home garden, there are lots of what, what we would say are kind of distractions for insects to find. Um, so they're not going to just visit one tomato plant and then another tomato plant. There might be lots of other stuff that you've got planted in between to distract them. Um, so what the seed garden does is sort of describes, here's uh, recommendations on a commercial scale. Here are recommendations for um, a really, a really uh, great seed saver in a home scale. And then here are some recommendations just if all you want to do is get seeds and you're not that concerned with, with saving those. So um, the Seed Garden is, is the newest publication, the most comprehensive publication of, on seed saving. Um, and it's got the most diversity in its recommendations. Um, and what I'm usually, so 200 feet if you want to make very, very certain, but if you put them on opposite corners of your garden, um, if your garden plan works out like that, that's probably more than sufficient. So, yeah. Uh, like I said, we, we have our 
Polish linguist is at one end, and then everything for mass canning at the other. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so we, you might say we revere the Polish linguist. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's great. It sounds like you're doing a great. It sounds like you're doing exactly what you but need to do. But we want to expand on that to our beans, mm -hmm. to our squash, to our lettuces, mm -hmm. and for instance, like the lettuces, we mm -hmm. always have the red sale and the other lettuces all pretty much in mm -hmm. one row. Uh, and that must actually spoil the gene pool. Mm -hmm. Lettuce isn't too big of a concern. Lettuce, actually, when lettuce flowers open up, as the lettuce flowers opening up, you've got stigmas and uh, anthers inside. And so as the flowers opening, the stigma actually brushes against the anthers and is pollinated almost before the flower opens. And then the flower closes, it up, closes up after a couple hours and doesn't open again. So with lettuce, um, I know members of ours will save seeds from lettuce plants that are growing um, just a couple feet from one another. And as long as they're not physically brushing up against one another, um, they think that's good enough and they've had great success with that. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. So, some other questions? Okay. Um, I was taught to save tomato seeds by my grandmother mm -hmm. when I was a little kid. And she didn't like the stuff that stinks. Yeah. So what we would do was squeeze the tomato onto a pile of paper towels, mm -hmm. and then individually with your finger, you rub it in a little circle till all the slimy stuff came off. Then you pick the seed up and you put it on a paper plate. Mm -hmm. And then you dried it. Does the fermentation what, what purpose, uh, what am I missing by mm -hmm. not doing the fermentation? Yeah. Um, the fermentation, and actually, uh, one thing that you mentioned, getting those gelatinous sacs out of the seeds, um, those contain a lot of those enzymes that prevent seeds from germinating. So even by doing that, you are, you are doing part of the, that fermentation process. Um, and just because it's, so when you plant the tomato seeds as well, because some folks don't even do that, they'll squeeze their tomatoes out and then they'll just sprinkle them out on a paper towel and then they actually just plant the paper towel when they're ready to plant the tomatoes. Um, and, that, and they've had great, great success with that. The fermentation process for us um, helps to increase our germination rate and it also, they'll germinate quicker. It's not like they'll, they won't ever germinate if you put them in the ground with those enzymes, but as, if those enzymes will break down in the spring and then the seeds will sprout. Well, I do remember it was a big deal. You had to get the slimy <laughs> yeah. stuff off. Yeah. And literally just drying little circles over and over. So. That's great. I haven't heard of that one, but I really like it. It works. I really like it. Well, yeah. it sounds like Terry and I are across the tree, you and you. <laughs> yeah. I like to pick up the drops, uh -huh. have a certain degree of rock to them, squish them out on the paper towel. <laughs> and uh, so it sounds like we partially fermented it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, so I think I want to mention related to that, but um, I know there's efforts in some communities to have a seed sharing um, mm -hmm. library, and yeah. and I know there are also some questions on on maintaining the integrity of the seeds or knowing mm -hmm. what if the seeds are truly what they are represented to be. And can you just comment mm -hmm. on those? Yeah. sort of amateurish efforts to do that? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a, a, a great topic and it's really relevant to the work that we're doing as well because we are a network of amateurs that are, are saving seeds and many of our members are, are well beyond that amateur level and, and we've got members that are saving seeds from a thousand different tomatoes and offering seeds to other members in, in the catalog. Their operations are just incredible. Um, but we uh, find that seed sharing um, projects typically take like one of two forms. One is that there's a central sort of repository where people just save seeds and then they drop the seeds off and they might write a little description about the seeds on a packet and then other folks can come and take those seeds and, and get them. Um, the other model for seed sharing is having a seed swap or having an event where the people that grew the seeds are actually there and can be and can you, you can ask them questions about how they're saving the seeds. You can ask them questions about well, what do you do with your tomato seeds? Do you rub them on a paper towel? Do you let them sit and rot or, or what? 
Um, and you can also find kind of more information um, about the history or growing characteristics of that variety as well. Um, so we love seed swaps. We really like seed library sort of things where people are growing seeds and dropping them off as well because that's increasing access to seeds. Um, the best thing to do is try and talk to the people that grew the seeds and ask them some questions about how they grew that. Um, but uh, you know, in, in some cases, still you don't know until you until you grow it out. Um, and that is, um, I, I think, one of the challenges of of um, informal seed sharing programs is that it is a little bit of kind of up in the air. Um, if you're getting seeds of tomatoes and lettuce, beans and peas. Um, and the seeds look good, um, it, it's likely that you'll have a lot of success growing those out. Um, but with other crops, if you're, if you're getting, um, you know, carrot seeds, corn seeds are going to be really tough with these informal or these sort of amateur seed savers. But if you're able to ask them questions like, well, how do you keep your carrots from crossing with Queen Anne's lace? Or um, have you grown this, you know, how long have you been saving seeds? And if they've been saving seeds for couple years and, and have been having success, then, then you should too. But yeah, it is a little, you're, you're really not sure until you grow it out, but yeah. Do you or the staff at Seed Savers ever, I don't even know how to say it, edit your database? I mean, mm -hmm. if I give you a tomato and someone else in town gives you a tomato seed, do you ever grow them out and say, wait, this looks like the one we got three years ago. It's mm -hmm. the same height, the same weight. Do you ever compare or do you just? Yeah, we absolutely do. We do that all the time. And we, if we have two varieties that have been donated, we'll sometimes we'll grow them out side by side and see like, is there any difference? In one case, we had a variety of bean called Molly's bean. And we had another variety of bean in our collection called Aunt Molly's Bean and they've been donated at two totally different times by two seemingly unconnected people. Um, we grew them out and we sort of started asking questions like they look the same and beans are pretty charismatic and you know bean seeds are you can tell a lot about a variety by looking at the seeds um, and so we did some more digging to try and find out more about this variety and we found out sure enough Molly was a distant relative, and Aunt Molly was a closer relative. Um, it was the same person, um, and we, uh, yeah, we we find stuff like that all the time. Yeah, yeah, and even even today, we actually there are we had an article in a recent um, in the most recent catalog. We have a bean that people have been growing for many years called the Lazy Housewife bean. Um, the Lazy Housewife bean um, is a an old bean, a stringless bean. Um, so named because it was because it was expected that a housewife didn't have to do as much work if she was the one doing the beans. Um, we recently found out that w the one that we've been offering as lazy housewife isn't actually isn't actually the the bean that we thought it was. The bean that we had thought it was it was was a bean that Burpees originally introduced called the lazy wife bean, um, and we've since gotten seeds of this lazy wife bean and we've added it to our catalog, but we're, yeah, we're finding out all the time. Um, there's, I don't know if Craig mentioned the, um, a variety of tomato called Mexico midget that we have in our catalog that he thinks is different than the Mexico midget that he, that, that it should be. So we're still, yeah, we're finding that stuff out all the time. So any other questions? I have a comment. Yeah. Here, here, here. I'm loud. <laughs> Some years ago, I was given a, a moonflower seed mm -hmm. uh, from a couple, John and Mary Hahn, down in southwest Iowa. And uh, they told me that that seed came by covered wagon from Indiana that, uh, through their descendants. Mm -hmm. And they'd been growing that moonflower ever since. Yeah. And they said, it blooms at night and will grow in the worst soil. So naturally, I plant it under the walnut tree. <laughs> Blooms this big, unfurls as you watch it wow. over a period of time. And it's just marvelous. And every time I've given away a pod, I tell my friends, grow this. It will make you happy. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. So, anyway, 
the seeds are more than just sharing. They're gifts. Yeah, absolutely. That's a fantastic, I don't know if anyone has any other questions. All right, that's a pretty fantastic way to wrap things up, I, I'd say. So I'll be around to answer questions if you've got questions just individually. Um, as well, but yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming. This was a great way to end our summer reading program for the year. Thank great. you. Thank you very much. <laughs>